In case of evil clown, pull string. Sounds good to me. Honk, honk. I've got a new question for you, friends. Is there power in symbols? And can you destroy that which is symbolic? Let's learn more by investigating a bit of a case study, which in many ways reflects the pith of that question by examining the phenomena of Clown World. At some point in early 2019, a meme originating on some super secret club for tandem bicycle knitting enthusiasts began appearing as a form of a gay Nazi frog donning a rainbow clown wig and a red nose. The meaning behind this meme is to represent the concept that the world is terminally ill, beyond any hope of salvation, and as such, we are but the audience. They get to sit back and imbibe in our bread and circuses while embracing the concept that it will all end in a blaze of fire, dancing to the tune of fiddles as the world burns around us. When the world's gone mad, why not embrace the madness? It's an inherently defeatist stance which reflects the feelings of many conservatives in the current year. While Trump has done many of the things that we asked of him, including lowering taxes, many of us find ourselves becoming increasingly unimpressed, to say the least, by some of his actions. The commander-in-chief, who was voted into office by many, myself included, based on the platform of free speech, border security, and nationalism, now seems more interested in the interests of foreign nations. Despite portraying himself as protectionist in trade and elsewhere as semi-isolationist, he often seems more interested in the goings-on of Israel than the United States. And while he has secured some money for a border wall, that too kind of remains to be seen, and it's nowhere near the amount of money that was originally proposed. And as for freedom of speech, he has done nothing to curb the continual silences of online voices. The very voices that got him elected. But most egregiously, at least to me, was this the other day. Where Trump, the man who once said, WikiLeaks, I love WikiLeaks. Now has this to say about the arrest of Julian Assange. Uh, I know nothing about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. While Trump is seemingly dropping the ball on his promises, we also have a cavalcade of events which have done nothing but escalate the intergroup animosity between the left and the right over the last couple of months. From the harassment campaign against the Covington Catholic kids to the entire crapshoot that was the Jussie Smollett debacle, to Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's continual public oopsies of accidentally revealing her power level, to probably, most importantly, the shooting which occurred in New Zealand in March of 2019. And why is that so? Particularly because that event was laden with symbology. Symbolism designed to create and enhance division by the perpetrator's own words. And what has happened in the wake of that event? Everything that I said would happen, happened. And both people, like Candace Owens and PewDiePie, and symbols, from the OK sign to the topic of today's video, Clown World, are being silenced, isolated, and demonized faster than I can even keep up with. All with blatant disregard to the truth. From Austro-Israeli Avi Yemeni being deported from the United States because Jim Jeffries intentionally edited an old video with him, such as to paint him as somehow responsible for the New Zealand attack, something which he proved with a personal recording and evidence had been doctored. What gives anyone the right to tell anyone where they can and can't live? When you import this culture, what do you think is going to happen? Australia's going to end up the same shithole that they came from that they were escaping. What gives anyone the right to tell anyone where they can and can't live? Really? Like, um, like, borders? Uh, I know, like, 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 no right? borders, yeah. but wouldn't it just be nice if, if we got to a place in society where we had utopia, no, a well, new, this a is, utopia, where we all just lived as well. I, I, on, 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 on a level I agree with you. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I I'm think, not the I think most, most people, most you know, sensible people would agree with you in theory. Yeah. But in practice, it's not, it's, it goes against human nature. It just doesn't work. To the recent hit piece from renowned journalist Jared Holt, who wrote on the white supremacist nature of jesters, all in and of itself, further proof that we live in a clown world. And that's why this symbol has so much potential meaning. There is the defeatist aspect and the absurdist aspect. Because what we are left with is a confusing as all heck society and culture which constantly faced with hypocrisy, contradiction, and outright pure insanity. I think regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, we can all agree that the world has gone just a little bit topsy-turvy, yeah? Although I can't imagine we'll be hearing the bells of Notre Dame anytime soon. I can't think of a day over the last two or three years I haven't woken up to at least one or two stories that baffled me in the incomprehensible insanity of the world in which we live. And I'm sure that some, even on the complete opposite side of the political spectrum, likely feel the same way that I do. I mean, I know they do, because they went out into the street and did this. Donald J. Trump is now President of the United States. President Obama. That is the essence of what inspired the original Clown World postings, to embrace whatever joy can be gleaned from the observation of this dumpster fire rather than struggling in vain against it. In terms of learned helplessness, this is the final stage of that effect. 
Although I've mentioned it before, learned helplessness was first described by Seligman in 1972, who placed dogs in different cages wherein the animals were treated normally, given a violent shock but also a lever to end the shock, or shocked at random with no ability to assuage the pain. Eventually, the dogs who felt they had no ability to stop the electric shocks ceased any attempt to ameliorate their conditions. And that right there is Clown World. You can't stop it, so you might as well accept it. It's the end of the world party. Learned helplessness replaced with finding enjoyment in the absurdities of reality, and it is represented by a symbol dubbed Honkler. I feel so weird describing memes this way, guys, but it actually is a really interesting thing to study, so let's try to look at it critically. My hat, my rabbit, his backstage passes, my fake fangs, a few birds, my pogo stick, my donkey ears, my extended tongue gag, my rubber chicken, he can't even get these anymore, my lucky whale tooth, and a giant clam that opens to reveal the American flag held by a mermaid in while I'm sure many, if not all of you know this, memes are a socially shared meaning understood by many which are disseminated through human interaction. A bit like a plague, reaching from node to node across a social network, be it physical or digital. Honkler being based on an existing number of memes is merely the public face for the concept of clown world. The idea behind him is, again, far deeper, that the world is an asylum and the lunatics are running it. Around the same time that Clown World posting became more common on various Peruvian wood flute carving forums, so did the overwhelming support for Andrew Yang, hashtag Yang Gang Yang Gang Yang Gang. For those unfamiliar, Andrew Yang is a billionaire contender for the Democratic nomination in the United States 2020 election, and I have to be completely honest, for once, I actually can't tell if everyone is being sarcastic or if it's I who have lost my mind, although I suppose, as Kurt Vonnegut once said, a sane person to an insane society must appear insane. That again is the very pith of Clown World, so pardons if I sound insane here, but Andrew Yang is a Democrat who seems to be okay with open borders, he's been a bit vague on that though, admittedly. We have well over 12 million undocumented immigrants here in this country. And to me, the most logical and humane path forward, path forward is to create a uh, pathway to citizenship for people who are here undo undocumented. Yet is proposing universal basic income, that being everyone would get about a thousand dollar dues a month, with the anticipation that they will try to work harder to subsidize that income. But as far as I can tell, those two things are so at odds with one another as to boggle the mind. Without an extremely limited immigration policy, how can you offer that level of free gibbs and not expect the swell of immigrants the U.S. already sees to turn into a deluge? He also recently said that the only reason Puerto Rico is in a state is because they aren't white. And one of the, the, um, the it's, it's like a statement I make is that if Puerto Ricans looked like Swedes, they would have been Americans a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> So it's the same call for Gibbs and identity politics that mirrors, as far as I can tell, any other Democrat contender. Yang is, however, very much in support of an internet bill of rights. And for the people who have given up and embraced the clown world, then yes, Yang is a very attractive figure. The world is falling apart, regardless of what I do. So give me my neat bucks and I'll watch the fireworks from the comfort of my computer desk. And I can't say I don't understand the allure of this concept. I mean, I've been laughing at dumb stuff in the news in front of you, dear friends, for two years now, and I still manage to find it funny, if increasingly depressing. But I also still have a desire to fight and not resign myself to watching the world burn, as naive of me as that may be. For many, though, embracing Clown World is the natural course, and I guess I understand why they've given up. But more specifically, what I want to talk about today is the symbols of Clown World and how banning an image like Honkler or Clowns is likely to do nothing to destroy the meaning behind it. After a riveting expose written by notorious wingnut Dengus Jared Holt on the evils of Honkler following the New Zealand massacre, well, yeah, now clowns are on the chopping block. Good, I've been waiting for years to get rid of this clown motherfucker. Oh, that's right, lads, I was on the Hong Kong train way before it was cool. Yeah, I was into it back when it was really, really embarrassing rather than just regularly embarrassing. Excuse me. The reason Jared wrote this hit piece is because he saw the connection that he could make between a massacre and a symbol, a method of conveying information. This connection came in the form of the Killer's Manifesto, which is riddled with memes and references to various parts of online culture, particularly the edgy parts of the internet. As a consequence, Jared and others have begun to stigmatize innocent makers of merriment, and that's now transcending into calls for the removal of the clown emoji, the removal of Honkler in general, and denigrating anyone who posts anything clown-related. Recently, this happened with the OK sign, again, as Blizzard banned the emoji from chats given its supposed link to white supremacy. And with this silly sod, 
admitting that yes, he recognized that this was a joke, but since the left fell for it and imbued this symbol with the meaning that was being joked about, it now contains that meaning. The problem is, like with all memes, it got completely out of control. What f***ed up is that actual white supremacists have decided they like using the hand sign. It got so bad that the Anti-Defamation League has stated that while the OK hand gesture isn't exactly a racist hand signal, it has been used by some white supremacists. And interestingly, that is kind of how symbols work, but we'll get more into that. It's now also potentially spreading to the thumbs up sign. Another joke just to see if the left would take it, run with it, and imbue it with the meaning that they were joking about, and they're likely to. And this attack upon symbols is designed to kill that symbol by exposing it to the harsh light of day. And interestingly, in some ways, I think Jared Holt and Blizzard actually succeeded in doing that when it came to Clown World, but not in the way they seemingly described, nor probably intentioned. Symbols are representations of concepts. The symbol can change in its meaning, but the meaning is never destroyed. So let's first describe symbols and their meaning. A symbol is an image, an icon, a figure, a sound, even a taste which represents an idea or a concept. For example, the Japanese concept of umami, the savory nature of food, is a mere word that describes a sensation which kind of transcends description itself. Making dashi stock with bonito and kombu produces a flavor that the word umami doesn't even fully encompass the feeling of what umami describes. The word is a symbol for a feeling. The core meaning in my mind and anyone else who has experienced this type of flavorfulness will similarly understand the term umami. It is through this mutual understanding that symbols are spread. But while you can potentially remove or ban a symbol itself, can you so easily remove the meaning behind that concept? While there's plenty of research we could look at specifically on the spread of memes, the spread of symbols has also been examined, and unlike many memes, which are often just jokes, symbols convey meaning. And Honkler and Clown World, they convey a meaning. For what we're looking at today, we need to get a little bit more complex than just describing symbols as flags or monuments, and look at what comprises a symbol, be it historical, psychological, emotive, or cultural, by starting with my favorite, social identity theory. For a brief review, social identity, as identified by Taj Fell and Turner in 1979, posits that a large portion of our self-concept, including self-esteem and psychological resilience, is related to various groups to which we belong. These can be intrinsic, such as sex or race, or elective, such as fandom or hobbies. Generally speaking, this differentiates people into us versus them categories, into in-group versus out-group. We tend to like our in-groups and at best be indifferent towards people who don't belong to our group, based on salience of group identity. That is, how much one is thinking about an individual involvement in a particular group at any point in time. We think this way because as humans, we crave a sense of belonging. We are social animals. But also because we want to assert the relevance and relative power of our own group versus outgroups, particularly when we're in a relatively low status group, a fringe group, which has received some support in the findings of Mullen, Brown, and Smith, 1992, who conducted a meta-analysis of 137 studies of group identity, who provided evidence for the prevalence of in-group preference, and also found that artificial groups, small groups, expressed more in-group preference the higher their status, while real, extant groups actually expressed lower in-group preference preference the higher their status. That is, temporary groups are least affiliative when they're low status, but real groups are most affiliative when they're low status. People find they have the most in common when you have stripped them of their power. And given our great preferences to those similar to us, symbols which represent in-group identity can have significant effects on behavior. For example, if someone's Twitter profile is a picture of a hammer and sickle, that's a sign to me that they're probably going to be an annoying twat. But that's just my perspective from my identity. The same person surely thinks the same of me when they see MAGA in my profile, another symbol of identity, one quite relevant currently, as we've seen. Other uses of symbols include remembrance of aspects of history. While the obvious example is the Confederate flag, which we'll talk more about later, think instead about 9-11. And you better think about it because hashtag never forget. And to prove the importance that we only need look at the faux pas of Ilhan Omar, who seemed flippant about the now nearly two decade old event for the public to explode in outrage over her insensitive handling of the topic due to the emotional attachment to the idea of 9-11. Care was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something. 9-11, the Twin Towers are a symbol. The idea of American loss, freedom, patriotism, and solidarity is what that symbol represents. And to say someone did something diminishes the meaning behind that symbol. There are also cultural aspects of symbols, which are narratives heavily influenced by cultural variables such as race, religion, sex, and social class, all affected by ongoing political discourse. That is, what is a relevant symbol to one culture may be meaningless to another, or an old symbol may actually resurface over time with renewed importance, such as the Gadsden flag has over the last 30 or so years. 
a relic from the Revolutionary War period, or the even more ancient Moulin Levé in its modern recreations and popularity. A symbol itself can lie dormant for hundreds of years while the meaning is less culturally relevant, only to resurface due to current political climates. Sometimes with the same meaning, sometimes with adjacent meanings, and sometimes with completely oppositional meanings. There is no better example actually than the swastika. The symbol has been used for thousands of years by Indo-European peoples to mean goodwill or good fortune. And yet when I show you this symbol today, what do you think of? But with all that in mind, let's look at a bit more of an obtuse description of symbols by looking at social representation theory. Moscovici, 1988, describes social representations as, quote, "...the contents of everyday thinking and the stock of ideas that gives coherence to our religious beliefs, political ideas, and the connections we create as spontaneously as we breathe." While representations are often to be located in the minds of men and women, they can just as often be found in the world, and as such examined separately. Representations can be preserved on parchment or in stone, in some forgotten places without having left a trace as such in anyone's mind for a thousand years. Well, what the heck does that mean? It means we use objects, physical or imaginative, as representations of our knowledge and beliefs about the world around us, which we continually form based on exposure and experiences and then subsequently transmit to others, creating a larger adoption of this social representation that we've made. It is through the sharing of representations that we come to understand the world, both past and present. It is functionally impossible for any of us to be masters of all fields of knowledge after all, but through social representations, we can come to understand complex information in a truncated manner. For example, when I say the word gene. Genes is, is all. Genes is you. Genes is me. Genes. Genes is everything. Genes are genes, but they're also everything. Or DNA. You might think about the image of the double helix or the basic understanding that our genes are the building blocks that make each of us unique human beings. But how many among us know which genes are responsible for even something as seemingly simple as eye color? I know I can't and I read a paper about it. <laughs> the double helix is a social representation, a symbol, of essentially colloquialized information about genetics. Further, Mascovici posits that some representations will be uniform in their meaning across populations. Consider the emoji. People with no mutual language can both understand this and this. Other representations may be more prominent in some groups rather than others, but can coexist without conflict. For example, you may prefer one of the three varieties of PewDiePie, including original, green, or red flavor PewDiePie, and while they all have their own dedicated fan bases, which may be exclusively watched, the symbols and jokes generated by these fan bases and by the creators are rarely at odds with one another. They exist in mutual statuses, essentially. But finally, some representations are intensely divisive across groups, and this division can cause tensions within individual groups and escalate towards the general populace as representations spread socially. Even the states? Yeah. But don't hold it against me. I'm try not to. Let's try not to say anything too loud or crass. Okay, so we understand a lot about what symbols are now. They can be intergroup, emotional, cultural, historical, or a complex combination of all four as described by Mascovici. They are constantly changing in their relevance and their usage, and while the meaning itself is not lost, a symbol can resurface seemingly at any time with any meaning. Let's then look into why we use symbols. From the framework of social identity, we use symbols to distinguish our in-groups from our out-groups, us versus them. An obvious symbol is that of the flag, and all of the meaning bestowed to it. Kemmel Meyer in Winter 2008 illustrated this by finding that exposure to the American flag increased participants' nationalism, which they defined as a feeling of national superiority, but not their patriotism, defined as non-competitive love for one's country. And keep those two definitions in mind, friends, because they're going to be used consistently throughout this video. I didn't make up the definitions, I'm just following the rules. Some people look at a flag swaying in the breeze at the White House and they say, that's America. Me, whenever I see a, an American flag hung in the window of a basement apartment by guys who have better things to do with their money than buy curtains, <laughs> I say, that's America to me. So given that exposure to the flag increased nationalism, you might think that exposure to this nationalistic symbol would increase reported disliking of outgroups. But 
But Plant and Doer 2007 actually found the opposite. The researchers exposed participants to subliminally flashed images of the United States or the Italian flag and found that those exposed to the US flag correctly identified words related to equality more expediently and that the priming of egalitarian thinking that was elicited by the exposure to the US flag significantly reduced anger and hostility towards Muslims and Arabs from US citizens. Further, they found that this effect was particularly pronounced in those more nationalistic, who otherwise expressed their um, significant distaste for the Islamically inclined. That's ridiculous, Lemon. Some of our greatest patriots have been of Middle Eastern descent, and I'm appalled to hear you engage in racial profiling like that. I'm kidding. Be an American, call it in. This capacity of the American flag as a symbol to serve as an object of cohesion rather than division is reflected in Wright and Citroen 2010, who showed participants images of pro-immigration protests, with the protesters waving either the American flag or Mexican flags, and found that the presence of the American flag produced less negative emotions than the Mexican flag. This was particularly limited to independents, conservatives, and republicans, those highly patriotic and believe that America is superior. This is likely because the waving of the American flag produced feelings of shared national identity causing more conservative, nationalistic people to recognize the protesters as fellow members of the American polity, rather than filthy, dirty foreigners. With their kung fu and all that silly chang chang chong talk, I can't understand you. Go back to your country, white power. This actually might be empirical evidence for the existence of conservatism further, as Gelpi, Roselle, and Barnett 2013 found that in people higher in right-wing authoritarianism, an instrument I've expressed many qualms about with you in the past and you can learn more about here, linked above and below, but which generally attempts to measure conventionalism, submission, and aggression. Anyway, those high in RWA and who tended to lean more Republican, who were exposed to flags in news coverage of the 2010 Times Square bombing attempt, showed greater support for the war in Afghanistan and decreased support for civil liberties. Both things I don't agree with, by the way, but only when they weren't interested or informed about the topic otherwise. But it just goes to show how one symbol can have very nuanced meaning for individual perceivers within any group. Moreover, it's important to note that the United States flag is one unique symbol with its own unique meanings, specifically ones related to freedom, equality, and egalitarianism. To illustrate how the same type of symbol, though, can elicit vastly different meanings, let's look at Becker et al. 2011, who exposed German participants to the German or the United States flag and asked them questions about their associations with that flag, their levels of nationalism, and their prejudice, that being more or less negative opinions towards immigration in Germany. Gosh, don't you just love how the bias bleeds off the page in some of this research? <laughs> Anyway, while the most common association with the German flag was sports with 80 reports, hey, that rhymed, 50 participants associated the flag with Hitler and Nazism. They found in contrast to what we've seen with the American flag, activating feelings of equality in the more nationalistic was reverse in the Germans. More nationalistic Germans expressed significantly higher prejudice against immigrants after looking at the flag. Same type of symbol, completely reversed meaning. Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? <laughs> I don't, so... Hands. Are we the baddies? <laughs> Looking at some other countries, Finnell and Zogmeister. Hmm, Zogmeister. I wonder who could be behind this research. Anyway, Finnish participants were primed by Finnish symbols and words, such as Suomi Nito, the maid of Finland. Hooft. <laughs> Not only are Finns excellent shit posters, they are the Japanese of the West now, aren't they? Anyway, after this exposure, implicit and explicit feelings towards Somalians and immigrants in general were assessed. And the researchers found that Finns who were primed with an image considered polarizing of the Winter War, in which the Finns, including the absolute mad lad Simo Haya, were an image of Finnish nature, found that people who saw the polarizing image expressed both implicit and explicit greater distaste for immigrants and Somalis, when they were also high in blind patriotism. In summation, Finns who loved Finland and saw an image of the Winter War were less accepting of their brown-skinned brothers. But up to now, we've pretty much looked at exposing someone to a flag. What about people who choose to display flags? Research from Australia, from Fosdar, Spittles, and Hartley 2015, found that people who displayed the symbol of the Aussie flag on Australia Day were less accepting of other cultures, more patriotic, nationalistic, and even expressed more positive attitudes towards the historic white Australia policy, which was more or less what you might think it was. It was a series of proposals and policies which were targeted particularly against Asian products and immigration in the land down under. But let's let some Aussies from 1962 tell you what they had to say about it. Keep them out. Keep all that. Japs and everybody. Why? Well, we don't want them. Want you you consider you're superior to the colored people. No, I don't know about that, but I do know this. We had enough trouble to get rid of the Kanakas in Queensland. 
Interestingly, while those who bore flags were less positive towards Asians, Muslims, and asylum seekers, they were about as positive towards Australian aboriginals as those who did not display the flag. Again, I'll let the Aussie circa 1962 express the sentiment in his own words. The white Australian policy? Mm. Well, I think it's all right as far as it goes, but I still think we should give our abos a good fair go. Mm. The flag wavers believed that Australia should blend in with other countries, but they preferred that Australia remain culturally distinct. All right, here's the Australian flag, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to... Fix your flag. <laughs> And just to close out this multi-ethnic exploration of the multiple meanings of a single symbol, Becker et al. 2017 investigated the meaning of national flags by the things that citizens most closely associate in 11 countries and found the following. Australia, sports. Canada, democracy. Germany, again, we went over this, sports. India, sports. Hey, wonder if it's T-Series now. New Zealand, democracy. Oh, it's definitely not that now. Northern Ireland, the Irish tricolor exposed to Northern Irish, sports. The Union Jack exposed to Northern Irish. Power. Scotland. Democracy. Oh, it's definitely not that now. <laughs> Singapore. Obedience. <laughs> yeah, I can see why. Turkey. Power. Can see that one too. And the US. Once again, democracy. The end. Just kidding. There's always more research. As Mascovici posited, there may be some symbols which peacefully coexist, yet have more or less intensity of meaning for one particular group over another in altering behavior, which was examined by Guggen, Martin, and Stefan 2017 concerning the people of Brittany. Although a region of France, Brittany has its own flag, language, and remained independent from the French until the 1600s, to see if local identity had more of an effect on behavior than national identity. While the researchers found that the Bretons generally preferred products labeled with the flag of Brittany, the Gwen Hadou, more importantly for us, the researchers conducted a series of experimental studies that are freaking awesome. In one study, the researchers had a confederate pretend to be homeless with a sign begging for money, upon which was placed a small French or Brittany flag or no flag at all. And if you're wondering, yes, they made the confederate wear dirty ripped up clothing for this, although I think any potent odor may have served as a bit of a confound. More people gave more money to the homeless man or woman when they bore the Gwen Hadou with no effects on giving using the French flag. In another experiment, Confederates seemingly accidentally dropped a glove while wearing a blank shirt or one with a French or Breton flag on it, and the researchers assessed how many people picked up the glove and returned it to the Confederate. Again, Bretons were more likely to offer aid when they saw the local flag. The same was found in giving to charity, with the most being given to a Christmas fund for children when paired with the Gwen Hadou. Those exposed to the flag were less aggressive, more helpful drivers as well than those exposed to the French or other regional French flags. Further, it's important to note that the mere existence of a symbol can make a group seem more real and therefore easy to defend, as found by Callahan and Ledgerwood 2016, who created fake groups and fake symbols to represent said group across a number of studies, and found that exposure to a symbol, regardless of its realism, to those not a member of the imaginary group, so you know everyone, increased perceptions that that group was legitimate and even potentially threatening. What that means is that I could make up any image on the planet and say it's associated with white nationalism and the media will eat that up. And people who read that media will subsequently be afraid of the group because now it is associated with a symbol, with a manner in which they can express themselves through imagery conveying meaning. Somewhat relatedly, it's interesting to note that Greenberg et al. 1995 found that people who were primed with mortality salience, that is, thinking about death, were particularly affected in their thoughts about their own demise by symbols when they were given cultural objects to use for functional tasks, such as using a flag to sift dye or using a crucifix to hammer a nail. Ironic, I know. Crucifixion lasts hours! It's a slow, horrible death! Well, at least it gets you out in the open air. You're weird. In other words, symbols can threaten outgroups and can also threaten ourselves with thoughts of death or mortality when used incorrectly or defiled. Let's look further at the extremity of the effects of symbols on behavior. Carter, Ferguson, and Hassan 2011 found a particularly potent finding in relation to specifically the American flag, conducted during the election cycle of 2008 across four sessions before and after the election. The first study was concerned with personality variables, patriotism, and nationalism scales, current political opinions, and voting intention for Obama or McCain. A second study included the American flag in the upper left-hand corner on some tests and assessed voting intentions, warmth towards Democrats and Republicans, more questions about current events, and implicit associations test on preference for Democrats or Republicans, and towards John McCain or Barack Obama. 
After the election, participants were asked about who they had voted for, and they found that those exposed to the American flag in the Primean Association with questions about politics were significantly less likely to vote for Obama. Eight months later, the researchers asked participants about their assessment of Obama's job performance and opinions towards Democrats to see if there was any change and found only greater effects only in those who were primed by the American flag. What the fresh heck is this finding? What the heck? Seriously, being exposed to an American flag once had lasting impact for months? The researchers suggest that this is because the flag was displayed alongside questions about voting and therefore solidified political intentions under its influence. In other words, exposure to a symbol in the context of thinking about future behaviors can affect us for months or potentially even years. And I mean, if you want further proof of the power of symbols, Chen, 2018, found that citizens of the United States, the UK, and Australia were all less likely to engage in tax evasion when exposed to their respective national flags. US and British participants were exposed to the American flag or the Union Jack in comparison to the Canadian or no flag, and then told they would receive a bonus payment for their participation, but this bonus was subject to a tax, $6 US and £7 respectively, and were given a number to enter on a subsequent screen which asked how much money was to be deducted from their total pay. Those who saw the flag were more likely to enter amounts close to the one they were instructed to report. Similarly, Aussies reported more tax-compliant attitudes after seeing their flag. In other words, flags are particularly powerful symbols of group identity if they not only change behavior for months, but get people to fork over their cash. Once it starts hitting the wallet, you know it's a big effect. Hey, there's a guy burning the Puerto Rican flag! So we've looked at nationalist symbols, but what about globalist ones? Bruder 2003, dated for the purpose of illustrating a point, exposed people from France, the Netherlands, and the UK to symbols of the EU and found that generally most Europeans had positive associations with the EU. However, even at the time, these feelings were mixed in the UK. Further, exposure to symbols of the EU were related to a cultural aspect of perceptions of a monolithic European identity. I bring this up so we can see how a symbol can change over time in its meaning. Cram, Petrokios, and Mitchell, 2011, also dated, but for a point, displayed images of the European Union flag to people who identified as English, Scottish, Irish, or Welsh, or generally British, in a non-functional setting outside of a public building, or in a functional setting in an airport. They found that exposure to the flag only exacerbated existing opinions about the EU, be they positive or negative that the Irish were most deeply emotionally and positively impacted by EU exposure, and that a polarizing effect occurred when some were exposed to the functional condition, specifically in the Scottish and the Welsh, which are unique to the UK in that in many ways they are stateless nations. We got an update from the same cohort in 2016 from Patrokios, Stratos, and Cram studying the effects of exposure to the EU flag, specifically on the Scottish. By this time, they no longer found any positive effects from general exposure to the EU flag, and only found any dissent towards the idea of dissolution of the EU when participants were also shown negative news articles that represented danger to society. Similarly, Dumitrescu and Popa, 2016, found among Swedes that seeing images of politicians alongside the EU flag induced perceptions of the politicians as more dedicated to Europe than to Sweden. These findings display how a single icon that once instilled a sense of cultural identity can come to be expunged from a group as it grows increasingly divisive. Some symbols are not perceived of unilaterally across all groups. Obviously, seeing someone wearing merchandise representing the rival of your favorite sportball team will likely make your own group identity more salient and cause you to possibly negatively evaluate that person as an extension of being a member of his out group. There are some symbols which reflect positive group identification for one group, but to another group, that symbol may instead represent hatred or oppression. Mach 1993 highlighted the importance of context in understanding symbols, where he notes, quote, The same object can symbolize two quite different ideas and emotions, and the particular meaning depends on the context within the symbol is used. These are divisive symbols. Interestingly, even the American flag has become a divisive symbol, despite all we've learned about it so far. This America. <laughs> How did you do that? 
as found by Chen 2017, in a real big no-duh finding, I guess, who illustrated that exposure to the American flag promotes division across party lines, with Democrats who see the flag prioritizing spending for Democrat priorities, and Republicans the reverse. This is interesting, though, because it illustrates how a single symbol can be both unifying and divisive under different contexts and measurements of behavioral outcomes. A similar thing could be said of the Japanese flag, as found by Machida Nisen Jurokunen, who examined the Hinomaru, the setting sun of the Japanese flag and patriotism and nationalism in his country, and found a divisive effect of generation rather than party. Younger people, those under the age of 39, felt significantly less national pride when they saw the Hinomaru, while nationalistic opinions of older participants over the age of 39 remained relatively stable whether or not they saw the flag. Much as with the Germans, it's possible younger Japanese people carry negative attitudes about the former nationalist movements within their country. And on the note of nationalism, let's bring it back to my home, the American South. One of the most infamous divisive symbols is the Confederate flag. And given what we've already learned about the power of flags as symbols, you can reasonably start placing your bets on what we're going to find here. Erlinger et al. 2010 exposed students to a Confederate flag and assessed their intentions to vote for Obama in 2008, and found that while white participants reported significantly less support for the king of racial animosity himself, they also showed no greater support for white candidates, except a little bit more towards Hillary Clinton. Clinton, and unsurprising considering her mentor was an exalted cyclops in the clan of my own home state, Robert C. Byrd, best known for coining this term years before it was even a twinkle in Sargon's eye. If we practice that, there are white <gasps> I've seen a lot of white <gasps> in my time, I'm going to use that word. Additionally, while exposure had no effect on general attitudes towards black people, it did result in more negative perceptions of a black man, Robert, who is described as an aggressive freeloader. Gee, I wonder why. Further exposure to the flag had no effect on black participants. So it's not so much that seeing the flag makes whites hate blacks, but likely primes racial group identification towards specific individuals in that group rather than to the outgroup in Toto. Relatedly, Goldman et al. 2019 projected an image of a break room to students containing two laptops sitting on a table, one of which displayed either the Confederate flag or the Olympic flag to assess effects of the symbol on intercultural empathy and social dominance orientation. SDO is the degree of belief in superiority of one's own group over other outgroups. More conservative students showed lower support for group equality and intergroup empathy after seeing the flag, while more leftist students were more culturally empathetic in response. Attempts to start a conversation about the Confederate flag, as assessed in Moshberger 2014, through the song Accidentally Racist, which I had never heard <laughs> until I read this, by Brad Paisley and LL Cool J forwarded some of the most cringeworthy responses from audiences of either social group, because it's bad, guys. Starting a conversation doesn't necessarily ameliorate any of this, particularly not when the stimulus is so incredibly awkward. To give a more diverse perspective to this section, though, I'm going to quickly describe various chapters of this book from Moshberger and Phillips de Zalia, 2014, Symbols That Bind, Symbols That Divide. This was a fascinating read, and it gives us a lot of different perspectives on divisive symbols. For example, Brejic and Raovic examined people who were citizens of what was formerly Yugoslavia, and found that destruction of Yugoslavian-era monuments was not admonished, as it represented an erasing of a potentially oppressive time in their history. Interestingly, the former Yugoslavic people were indifferent towards Soviet monuments, seeing them as ancient history in comparison to more modern conflicts, again illustrating how symbols can change in terms of their meaning. And speaking of Yugoslavia, the subsequent bosnia Herzegovina nation is also highly divided across ethnic lines, and in their initial adoption of this hideous flag, all ethnic groups found it to be pretty much equally unsatisfactory, but for completely unique reasons. I, I mean, I would say just just look at the symbol, it's absolutely hideous, isn't it? <laughs> a similar finding to that of Bejic and Raovic can be found in Munoz Proto's chapter regarding the Chilean people. The Via Grimaldi was once an expensive Italian-style hacienda that became a torture chamber following the 1973 Chilean military coup, and thus a symbol once related to affluence and power became one of suffering, with the site now renamed the Park for Peace. A quantitative analysis of the responses to the March for Peace in Chile at the park displayed a conflict of emotions for participants from multiple countries, ranging from excitation regarding the march to devastation in the reflection of the torture which happened at the Via Grimaldi, expressing again how one symbol can have multiple meanings depending on the person and the context in which they are displayed. 
Staltis et al. 2014 looked at differences in perceptions of cultural symbols in Cyprus, a small country heavily divided along Greek and Turkish lines. Turkish Cypriots viewed a giant display of a Turkish version of the Cyprus flag on the side of a mountain as indicative of the existence of Turkish Cypriots, who had little to no contact with their Greek neighbors, while Greek Cypriots viewed the symbol as invasive, instilling alienation and even hatred. In contrast, participants were exposed to a public notice board, which included images and accused Turks of barbarism and brutality. It was was a sign that was possibly even placed there by Greek state officials. Interestingly, negative emotions of sadness and outrage were exacerbated when a participant saw the photos via media exposure rather than in person, emphasizing the potential impact of new media on divisive symbols. When people saw it face to face, they kind of blew it off, but when they saw it in media, it had much more meaning, at least to the Greeks. The Turks, in contrast, viewed the photo board as mere propaganda for the purpose of forwarding political agendas of the Greek Cypriot government, but only when they themselves had little contact with the Greeks. Desalia, in an analysis of the societies in Rwanda post-genocide, posits that in countries with poor education systems, meanings are conveyed through oral history and through symbols. From this, we can assume that many accounts may be unreliable more than more general historic records, at least sometimes. In the initial conflict, the Hutu politicians portrayed the Tutsi as foreigners, and the Tutsi the opposite. Europeans who became involved with the conflict saw the Tutsi as more related to Europeans, called the Hamitic myth, and thus generally supported their side. Given the fact that the Hutu and Tutsi are genetically nearly identical, years after conflict, this one symbol of the Hamitic myth continues to be disseminated and cause conflict in this region. Santos found a unique symbol of Christ in El Salvador that replaced his spear wounds with bullet wounds on a figure in reflection of the El Salvadorian conflict which raged from 1979 to 1992. Finding that El Salvadorians had integrated aspects of their own personal suffering into the visage of Christ the Redeemer. While this image might seem heretical by members of outgroups, to those from El Salvador, it takes on new meaning from personal history. Relatedly, on the topic of religious symbols, Stinger and Hunter looked at children in Northern Ireland and their acceptance of Protestantism versus Catholicism, and found that while children internally blame their own in-group for terrorist actions, externally, they tended to blame the out-group. That is, inside, they recognized some sort of group-based responsibility, but would not voice that externally, so as to maintain face for the group. Bornman, in mostly a review of his own research in South Africa, hence why I'm citing this chapter instead of the wealth of data from him individually, studied the effects of new, more Afrocentric symbols on the body politic of the nation, and found that while blacks were most supportive of this change and whites were generally accommodating, Afrikaners, the descendants of the Dutch immigrants to the nation, were at best indifferent to the symbol, potentially viewing it as an erasure of the complex history of South Africa, via homogenizing it. This is likely because, as Borman concludes, that the Dutch Afrikaners are more culturally distinct than black and white South Africans, representative in the symbol of Dutch involvement in the region in the Voortrekker monument. Without any representation of the Dutch, this symbol is inadequate for the Afrikaners, and creates a sensation that their symbols, that their existence is being erased, that it's being abandoned. And as such, let's talk about symbol abandonment. <laughs> Consider how much symbols can change and evolve in their social context, while the meaning behind that symbol remains unchanged. Metaphors? I hate metaphors. That's why my favorite book is Moby Dick. No frou-frou symbolism, just a good simple tale about a man who hates an animal. For example, the visage of Guy Fox. Fox himself was a Catholic who opposed the establishment Protestantism of Britain during the time, and plotted a murder attempt on King James in 1605. For hundreds of years, on November 5th, British people burned effigies of Fox as a traitor and heretic. But by the early 1980s, Alan Moore reinvigorated the meaning of the mask back toward upheaval and subversion of the mainstream in his graphic novel V for Vendetta. Almost 30 years later, the mask again became associated with another form of dissent from cultural norms represented by spurgs on a Korean Hmong Bing cultivation mailing list who then embarrassed themselves publicly by taking the internet offline and awkwardly standing in front of Scientology churches. This is David! You must fight the Thetans! The radio crackered, and so I grabbed my Aperture Science handheld portal device and looked through the wall! A symbol which was hated for years was brought back into the popular cultural milieu with some semblance of its initial meaning after centuries of popular denigration. In contrast, again, I'm reminded of the swastika, a symbol of peace and well-wishing now will be forever associated with hate and oppression. This displays the mutability of symbols. 
They are social representations that convey meaning. And thus, while they may change and alter and disappear for a time, it's very hard to kill a symbol. Frankly, there isn't a lot of research on the abandonment of symbols for this reason, because symbols are very rarely abandoned. We've seen symbols change in terms of their meaning, but with their original meaning surviving in other divergent formats. So let's look specifically at the total abandonment, or what is described of as the extinction of symbols as seen in Deshan 1972 and pastoral Israeli communities. And yes, his first name is Shlomo. So this is niche and it's old, but let's see what the researcher found. People in these communities were still adhering to older rites that were no longer embraced by the general Jewish community. Deshan specifically identified three symbolic behaviors, including the Kabbalistic rite of Nephilatapayim, proclaiming, quote, merciful and compassionate one, we have sinned before you, have mercy on us and save us, which again at the time was only being observed by Jews in this region of Tunisia rather than in Israel, to wearing the talit katan, a rectangular garment which was essentially extinct even by the 1970s in modern Jewish society, to beard shaving which was common in Israel and worldwide across Jewish communities but not in the Tunisian region. As they came to terms with modern changes, Tunisians began to abandon these symbols, but they also reported feeling deeply nostalgic about missing them. We're living in the Ooh. past. 3,000 years of beautiful tradition for Moses to Sandy Koufax. You're goddamn right I'm living in the Ooh. past! But Dashan is clear that there is a distinction between effacement and eradication of a symbol, maintaining that the meaning behind these symbols is not lost because they ceased in their inaction of them, but rather they become associated with other physical or cognitive symbols of meaning. In other words, the symbol itself may actually disappear, even if just for a time, but the meaning and cultural intent that is imbued into it is maintained even in its absence. And with that, let's come to some conclusions. The fact of the matter is that groups continually adopt, abandon, and change the symbols that they use. They may be less likely to do so when the symbol is historic in nature, but ultimately, symbols in and of themselves have the potentiality to change their meaning quite easily. But meaning? Meaning in and of itself, it's maintained. Symbols may give it more power, but it still exists. Without any belief or ideas behind it, any particular symbol, stripped of any context, is meaningless, and therefore of no consequence to society. What does this symbol mean? I don't know, I just made it up. It means nothing. But you can take it, imbue your own meaning into it, and make it a symbol of whatever group you want it to represent, whatever idea you want it to represent. But this is a double-edged sword in that symbols are also highly malleable. For example, Jared Holt bringing down Clown World through his expose only just exposed that meme, that symbol, to the mainstream, which means more people viewing it and only viewing it on the surface level meanings of Clown World, such as the absurdities of reality, without being cognizant of the subsurface meanings of apathy, resignation, and defeatism. Yet ultimately, regardless of Holt's little piece and the now mainstream understanding and recognition of Clown World and Honkler, the meaning isn't gone. You've just stripped it potentially from this one symbol. And as I've illustrated, the internet can always produce new symbols for you to latch on to. The meaning remains. As I said in the opening, many of the same people who posted clown world memes are potentially still aboard the Yang Gang movement. They can move from symbol to symbol, but the meaning will not be extinguished. I mean, look at this clown-faced, um, individual. She seems to think that Pepe is a symbol of fun and love, and she owns him now. Although I would say this person is a little bit special, it does illustrate how many diverse opinions can be held about a single symbol, and why symbols, as they reach a larger audience, become even more mutable in their meaning. Pepe the, fo the Frog, with his curly-ass Afro clown wig, belongs to me. That is a symbol of the resistance now. Most likely, Honkler will be subsequently abandoned by those who identified with its original meaning, and much as with the Kekistani flag, which once represented numerical Ouija, conducted on a Canadian Dick Cheese of the Month club to use hypersexuals created by shared thought to physically alter the course of human history via the morphogenic field, became an embarrassing sign of fedora tipping. But I want to make one last point about the meaning behind Honkler and Clown World. And here's the thing about defeatism, friends. If you don't fight, you can never win. Peace is a desire, war is a fact, and we have to keep fighting. Conflict is inevitable and interminable. And this is particularly of import currently with the destruction of the Notre Dame Cathedral, a powerful cultural and historical symbol of faith, ingenuity, creativity, and devotion is now, in many ways, lost to us. We can rebuild it, but some element of that symbol is gone. And if we resign ourselves to defeatism, then the meaning behind that symbol might just be forgotten, even if only for a time. We've learned that destroying a symbol destroys some of the legitimacy of a group, which is potentially why people like Jared Holt write hit pieces about memes, or there are people celebrating on Twitter the burning of this beloved cultural icon. Shut the f*** up. You're a f***.
Shut the fuck up. You're a stupid. Suck my dick. And while as seemingly sensical as it may be to give up in a clown world, we must not. Yes, destroying a symbol threatens the potency of the meaning behind it. Thus, while the meaning may not be completely gone, it is, in a way, diminished in power. And that is precisely why we've seen these threats against symbols that we have. And we've seen that those who see their groups as lower status are much more cohesive, while groups that are seen majorly as higher status are less cohesive. Any destruction of symbols is just another blow to group solidarity and an attack against the West in general. We should maintain symbols where we can, but accept that they will change over time, making sure to remember the meaning and when you're celebrating the destruction of an ancient symbol like Notre Dame, it's indicative that you have no logical arguments to go on. So symbols related to emotions of a given group are particularly juicy target. Yet still, we must not give up. And so I say unto you, those who have made it this far and have accepted defeatism, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I get that giving up is a comfortable response when it's accompanied by free money, by accepting Yang Gang or welcoming the clown world. It's an expression of complete degradation and depression, and you don't want to do that. I can't say that at the current time I will support Trump in 2020, but that doesn't mean I've given up on things like a more sensical immigration policy and a non-interventionalist attitude towards foreign affairs. My meanings will remain consistent, but maybe they will take a new form in different symbols other than the MAGA hat. I'm also not saying I won't vote for Trump in 2020, only that I'm disappointed in him, and as such, when I consider the meaning behind the phrase, make America great, I'm not sure I completely associate that idea with the orange man who is bad, at least right now. But what do you guys think? I know this has been long and a lot of information, but what do you think about the power of symbols as political motivators, be they homogenous or divisive? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, you can donate anything you feel so inclined on Patreon, Subscribestar, or Streamlabs, link below, or purchase something on my merch store. Thank you so much for your viewership, and as always, all Tana Volt.